Welcome everyone, Jonathan Hunsaker here with Organics, and I'm joined by my good friend, Jonathan Otto. Welcome, Jonathan. Hey, thanks, thanks, John. Great to be here, man. So listen, we're doing something a little bit different today. We're doing a Zoom call. Uh, Jonathan Otto and I, we've known each other for several years. You'll probably hear me call him Jono more than Jonathan, but Jono's expecting a little baby boy here any day now, is that right? That's right, yeah. So obviously the most a special and important time of my life considering it's the first baby um so lots of emotions and and certainly it's very relevant to what we're talking about today with health considering that my wife and i had huge health challenges that were preventing us from even having that experience but uh, we'll share more on that in, in, down the line but certainly a very beautiful and, and precious moment for my wife and i right now yeah i'm excited for you so I was just saying that because normally I prefer to do interviews in person. We generally don't do Zoom interviews, but we needed to do this because John was expecting a little boy and we had to get this information out to you. So John has been on a mission of his own to really just investigate more about brain health, right? John, you've done some documentaries about uh, Alzheimer's and depression. I'm sorry, Alzheimer's and dementia and other documentaries, and you're working on a documentary right now, correct? Yeah, absolutely. We, we find ourselves continually researching and, and looking for new answers, and, and certainly with this new series that we're just releasing, Depression and Anxiety Secrets, we, we went all out to really discover the, the true uh, mechanism that was causing this huge, and, and today is causing this huge epidemic that we see, not only with Alzheimer's um, and, and dementia with the neurodegenerative diseases, but also with mental health issues with, with Alzheimer's, with, with anxiety and depression. So we, we went after really both issues in this series, and we, what we found was nothing short of uh, just awe-inspiring, not, not only with the, the, the real unknown hidden triggers, but also with the, the things that we can practically do today to, to turn the situation around for ourselves and for our loved ones. So certainly this is really, really exciting. We've, we've seen such amazing preliminary responses from what we've been sharing with the results people have been getting apply, applying what we've been teaching. Excellent. So by the way, for those of you watching, you're going to be able to, to watch Jono's complete documentary absolutely free. We'll share the link with you a little bit later. But right now, let's just let's get into the nitty gritty. I want to I want to find out more about what you learned on your journey and just really share with our audience just what you've learned about depression and anxiety. So what are some of the most, I don't know, hidden or unknown causes of depression and anxiety? Sure. I mean, great question, John. And I think that this is this is one that we should all be asking and getting answers on, because I think when we look at the reality of our lives, a lot of us could really feel a lot happier and be a lot less worried or stressed out and strong. And sometimes we feel like it's a circumstance, like our job is stressful or our relationship is stressful, but the reality is our body is suffering. And so then we can't cope with the circumstances that are around us that in many cases are quite normal or their regular levels of, of anxiety and stress that people would experience. But now with the health challenge, then people are really starting to hit rock bottom. And there's something we can do about this and we wanna, we wanna take action immediately rather than wait and, and put things off. So the hidden triggers that we discovered through depression and anxiety secrets were actually very, very um, amazing. Because my first thought was that it was all about worldview and, and beliefs and, and self-worth and self-esteem and, and childhood trauma. And, and certainly that certainly these aspects are, are true. They are all triggers for the reasons why people are experiencing depression, and anxiety, but the most amazing ones that I found that were quite universal to all people were certain toxic exposures that we're all getting uh, that we, we know that there are huge issues with genetically modified foods and we know that it affects the body, but how does it affect the neurochemistry? And that was what we wanted to find out. And we, what we found out was that not only does it severely affect our neurochemistry, but it's affecting our microbiome. So genetically modified foods, for example, genetically modified corn, genetically modified soy, and as surprisingly enough, wheat falls in this category because before 1994, when the genetically modified organism laws were introduced and they were classed as GMOs, wheat was modified back in the 60s and its modification went all the way back to around 1843. So it's been experimented on for a long time 
And, and what we found was that the interference that these foods have with the microbiome means that our neurotransmitters in our, which is really where we're talking about serotonin, dopamine, no, no repinephrine, these are neurotransmitters that are supplied by our body's ability to transform nutrients into brain, basically what we'd call like brain chemicals or brain nutrients. And so when you're lacking, uh, it's not just because you're not taking the right supplement, even though supplements certainly can help and aid the imbalance in the fact that we do have issues with our soil and the fact that we're, we're having a nutrient deficiency. That's why supplementation is key. And I like what you guys, I love what you guys are doing with, with educating people on healthy supplementation. But what we're finding is that unless people want to remove these toxic triggers and are willing to take that step, they'll always find that there's going to be an imbalance because their body's interfered with and its ability to break down nutrients and the food that we're eating into neurochemistry, which is really the neurotransmitters that we all need. We're going to feel in severe amounts of uh, depression and anxiety, depending on whether our levels are too high or too low because of this imbalance that's been thrown off through our gut microbiome. And then the other major factors that we're, we'll, 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 we'll discover a few more later, but I'll, I'll, I'll just start with that little snapshot in, ter in terms of when you think brain, think gut. And when you think gut, think of what have I done and what am I doing that's interfering with the way that this is supposed to be working because that is where people start to feel uh, like they're not themselves anymore. And we can quickly clear that up when we go about uh, adequate detox and making better choices with with our eating choices. So let's talk a little bit more about that and the microbiome. I mean, because there's a lot of times people talk about that's our second brain down there, right? And your gut instincts and all of that. And you talked about you went rather quickly. So let, let's slow down a little bit about GMOs, right? And specifically glyphosate, right? Because I want our audience to understand why GMOs really affect and genetically modified organisms and plants affect our microbiome. For me, and I know I've, I've studied a lot about it, it's about the glyphosate that, that is also in there. So can you talk more about that and how that's actually affecting our microbiome, which then in turn is affecting, you know, how well are we able to uh, get the nutrients out of our food and all of that? Can you share more about that? Absolutely. So now, I mean, let's think about living organisms. Let's think about tiny life forms. So even breaking down the word microbiome, micro means small, biome is a living environment. And so you're talking about small living environments of organisms. So this is a life form. We have uh, trillions of these small uh, living organisms that are inside of us that are totally outnumbering us. And they're essential for our health in every area of our life. And this is why we can see people that take probiotics that are able to clear up skin infections and things like that. And you think, well, how does that work? Like it's not, they're not putting on a topical cream, they're ingesting a probiotic and it's clearing up skin infections. Why is that? Well, it's because of the microbiome that is communicating with the rest of the body and and helping the skin which is a detoxifying organ to do what it's supposed to do and 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 it, it there's these all these natural mechanisms of it's like clean clean skin or clear skin from within it's 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 the stomping ground so because of this because everything is governed by this living flora the issue with glyphosate and other toxic pesticides herbicides larvicides and fungicides notice the the commonality between all four of of those substances i mentioned all end in the word side right so now if i bring up the word suicide then you understand that i'm talking about death and the word side is the latin for for death so you're talking about the death of the pest the death of the larvae, larvae or you know these these organisms are all caused that they're killed right by this toxic chemicals that are sprayed to kill these life forms but now the issue with genetically modified foods is they're designed to be able to withstand things that plants normally can't withstand and and frankly it would be better that they died in these circumstances because because they don't die we look at it and if it looks clean from the outside we feel like it's food for us but it's harboring these toxic poisons and chemicals now they're still in the food because the, the plant has been engineered to withhold it and to be able to, and now it's coming into the system and now it is 
reaping it, it's reaping its fruit in our body and it's killing our gut flora. Now, mind you, the reasons why some of these things have happened, and some of them have happened in ignorance, and others have just simply happened because of um, corrupted companies that aren't interested in the well-being of people, but in just in the gain of what they're doing. What has happened is that uh, you know, our medical institution has commonly believed that gut flora are, are just bugs, and bugs need to die. And that's been the common misunderstanding in the medical field. So if you can understand that's even coming through medicine, you'll understand that there hasn't been much consideration that's been made on that point. So it's, you can't emphasize how important it is to feed your gut flora to not hurt it. That's the first step. Like if you want to know before you start taking like the kombucha or the probiotic or anything else, firstly think, how can I stop this war? And how, and how am I going to be mindful that I never let genetically modified foods enter my mouth? And remember, when I say gen genetically modified food, it's not all foods. The ones I mentioned, there's just a handful. Um, just do your research and, and look at those and look at the major food supplies. Certainly, Give us list again, wheat, John. Corn, yeah, so, so and, and wheat, corn, and soy would be the most major ones that people are going to get exposed to. There's also cottonseed uh, oil, and there's and then there's other, like canola oil would be another one, canola. And, and then there's a few that are being experimented with, but they're the major ones that you're going to get um, hit with. And remember, wheat is semi-dwarf high yield, meaning that in the 60s, it got pushed from being head height down to knee height, and it yields eight times as much as what it did previously. So we can clearly see that this plant has fundamentally changed, and studies have been done on this on this on this issue with, with wheat, uh, even the NIH did studies with bipolar showing that people, people's symptoms were actually with being off wheat for 30 days, having bipolar would mostly come back to normal and then they would reintroduce just to check their findings and then they'd find that people then became mostly back to their bipolar state or oh, sorry, schizophrenic state. So this was a study done on schizophrenia. Other studies have been done on bipolar, a lot to do with mental illness because what's happening is once we have foods that then cross through the, the um, it's called intestinal permeability where it, or leaky gut, where food proteins are getting into our bloodstream and inevitably they will end up uh, affecting the brain. And that's what, so that's leaky gut will cause leaky brain. And so we saw this with these studies that were done in mainstream and it's been out for decades now, but people aren't researching and they're not looking at it. But yes, I have seen cases and we cover them in our documentary with people uh, reversing bipolar through getting off wheat, with people reversing dementia through getting off wheat. And um, the one case that I'm referring is, is Dr. Kathleen Toop. She's a medical doctor who was conducting Alzheimer's studies, uh, getting people to remember three words. And when she couldn't remember the three words that she was getting people to remember, she realized that she herself had the issue and then she had to work out what was causing it. And she wasn't learning from the field that she was in, so she had to learn it herself. And it's the same thing that we're teaching. She shares it inside the series. And certainly wheat was the major cause for her uh, among uh, just doing some of the other things that we'll be sharing inside of the series and through some of this interview. So there you go, John. I hope that helps answer the question. It does. It does. I mean, it's just amazing. It's amazing the amount of toxins that we have in our environment nowadays than what we used to have and, and just a lot of the transitions that have happened you mentioned about something when you were talking about the different pesticides and herbicides and things like that. Talk to me about parasites for a second and talk to me about how, how do parasites affect our brain health? Okay. So what's interesting is that we can even look at some studies, for example, with parasites, uh, you'll find that a study that was done with schizophrenia was showing that one in five cases had the same parasite in common, which was T. gondii, which is the name of the parasite. So that's just one interesting anecdotal piece of evidence. Well, it's, well, it's a case study piece of evidence, but it's something to put in your mind that parasites can affect brain health. And we can see this, you can look at National Geographic documentaries where parasites in small organisms like ants and snails have the ability to actually take over the control of the brain of the species so they can actually decide what they want that organism to do for example if they want to be in the uh, liver of a cow they will take control of the ant's brain and find a way to feed it to uh the cow and it's very like haunting and, and like oh that's disgusting how how horrifying it's like a zombie apocalypse concept and and it's just straight out um 
from nature and uh, no science fiction here, you know, required it is it, sometimes the truth is stranger than fiction. And so you, you can see this with snails that you, you can actually watch the antennas and the parasite has taken over it and you can see it's now controlling it. It's finding a way to feed it to a, a bird. And um, so we know what happens in small organisms. I'm not saying that it, parasites can totally control a human's brain. It's, I think it's too big an organism, but they can control, eat, contr help control eating choices through cravings. And, and so some of the ways that you can realize that some of these things are happening is through symptoms. And this was certainly true for myself. It was true for my wife. And pretty much everyone we experimented with, with our own family, let alone all the things you can read and find out online. But what we discovered was that um, my wife, she was having issues with um, irritability. She was on medications, frankly, for depression and anxiety uh, and medication for both of those. She, she was battling with PTSD. She had a lot of different challenges on the mental side, but then she also had hypoglycemia, anemia, uh, so, so low iron and, and, so, and, and low blood sugar. So she was having these issues. And then what, what she found out was that um, parasites could be an issue. And it didn't seem like it made sense. I mean, growing up in America, how could this be, right? How could this be? Could this be happening in America? Now, notice what I shared with, with you before, John, that I mentioned that the issue that happens with glyphosate and other toxic uh, pesticides, they are killing microbiome gut flora. So now what happens is what's fascinating is once you start losing the gut flora, then the issue that happens is it gives the ability for other organisms to take over. And so parasites will thrive in acidic environments and they'll also thrive in environments that, where they don't have a threat because we can be exposed to them all the time through even airborne parasites, we can get them through um, just contact with other people, certainly through food. There are certain foods that have higher levels. For example, pork would be one of them, pig. Um, and, 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 but you can even get them through lettuce. So th there's all different ways you can get them. But normally the gut microbiome would defend and it would attack and kill these critters because microbiome is a defense for your body. They're their own, they're their own little ninjas, right? They can, they, they can kill these things. But once you start losing those issues, the, 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 the flora, then they'll come in. And the other reason why they come in is to do with heavy metals because they sponge heavy metals and we have a high metal exposure here in the West. Nevertheless, back to my wife's story to conclude that story. My wife does anti-parasite uh, medication. She stays consistent. She does it for a good three months, right? And so when I say anti-parasite, I'm talking about the ones that have been researched by people like Dr. Hulda Clark with wormwood and green harvested black walnut hulls with mimosa pudica seed um, with, so you can, you know, you can find anti-parasitic cleanses. You can do other uh, detox um, things that like uh, organics uh, are provided with to, to help the process because you want to have the bowels moving properly. You want to have your whole system working properly when you're doing parasite cleanses. So you can use these things in tandem. But point is she did it. And guess what? Um, she gets off her antidepressant meds. She gets off her anti-anxiety meds. She, she ends up, um, stabilizing her body. She's no longer hypoglycemic. She's no longer anemic. She no longer has excessive food cravings. And the other one that I didn't mention was irritable bowel syndrome, which she had uh, severely so that she couldn't eat a lot of foods that were healthy foods. And she's now able to eat whatever she likes. Uh, but she will still probably get a tummy ache if she eats wheat or gluten. But, but by that, she can eat all the good healthy foods, which was amazing. So we had such an amazing breakthrough that we felt like we had to absolutely share this with the world. And we saw more dramatic cases of people uh, reversing things when it came to mental health issues, I believe preventing a lot of neurodegenerative challenges because what you'll find is that people with Alzheimer's, you'll see an issue with bacteria, typically with people with Alzheimer's where you'll see um, issues with, sp with spirochetes, which are associated with Lyme. And uh, the best ways to combat Lyme, I believe, is to firstly go after the parasites to, to kill some of these bigger infections that people are having. So certainly it's, it's so important. It's not done in the West anymore. It needs to be done. There's no way around it. I don't believe that people need to get testing because if you get testing, you can easily test this negative when you are positive. And I keep seeing this over and over again. And, and it's the issue with the testing itself. 
because uh, it's all based on the issues with the cycling of the parasites. If the parasite has not shed eggs at that time, then you're, not, you're gonna show up as negative, but you could still have the parasite and they're not testing for all parasites. And there are over a hundred parasites. So that's a, they're major issues. And so then you can get a false sense of uh, security there. So I recommend that people do it because it's an epidemic in the West and I literally believe that everyone has some level of infection and that um, we can mitigate that very simply and very easily and we need to be consistent. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I lived down in Panama for several years and we would get parasites down there and I, I would have to do a parasite cleanse about every six months. And, um, and you don't think about it, but when I started researching it, started realizing, I mean, uh, the parasites are being brought in. If you have animals, I have a dog, right? And it's just very common to get parasites just from your dogs, tracking them in and out and from their food and from feces and from, I mean, it, it, we don't think about that we have the parasites or think about doing parasite cleanses as much. And I never thought about it till I lived outside of the country, but now it, it's essential to get them in there every once in a while, just to, to do a spring clean in the same way that I would do any other detox. So what are some of the parasite cleanses that you recommend? I mean, I know you're not affiliated, I'm not affiliated with any parasite cleanses, but I'm just curious what you found through your research for, for some of our listeners. What are some of the good cleanses or where should they start um, looking to even learn more about some of the parasite cleanses? Yeah, absolutely. So what I'll say is that um, look for these ingredients and that's my best advice on this subject. So look for these ingredients, look for, uh, ingredients like green harvested black walnut hulls, right? So we know walnut, so it's easy to remember. Green harvested black walnut hulls. Look for ingredients like neem, N-E-E-M. This is a great anti-parasitic herb. Look for clove, which is, you know, that's gonna be in your pantry. So certainly you can give that a shot. I wouldn't do it exclusively because I think it, it's not, it's probably not gonna get you the result you're looking for, but hey, it, it is an antiparasitic herb. Cayenne pepper is also an antiparasitic herb. So what you'll find is uh, spices are uh, good, good, they're aggressive against parasites. But again, you want to look at how to combine a couple of these things with things that are good to grab on and bind onto parasites. And another great ingredient is mimosa, pudica seed, if anyone remembers the alcoholic drink. And quick disclaimer on alcohol. Yes, alcohol is actually um, not good when it comes to parasites. They do create acidic environments for the parasites to live in. So certainly um, you want to you wanna be careful with your, your alcohol intake or eliminate it, which is a personal choice that I've made. But point is, people, people, most people could, could drink less and a lot of the benefits that we can get from something like red wine, we can get from grape juice or, or at least to make sure we're very moderate with that kind of intake. But back to the ingredients, the mimosa pudica seed is really great because it is a grabber and a binder. So you want to find things that will grab on and, and uh, web up the parasites if, if you like that analogy or scrub through the gut and be grabbing junk. And, and meanwhile, you'll be combating things like candida because you'll find that if anyone wants to work on candida, that it's such a challenge because the diet is so restrictive and you're restricting so many important nutrients and then you'll find that it just comes back as soon as you get back on those foods which are actually good foods but they're not in the anti-candida lifestyle but what you'll find is if you can do these types of things that are grabbing onto these pieces of junk like using mimosa pudica seed you'll find that your tongue is clearing up which is a good sign if it's nice and pink that you've you've combated and you've overcome your your candida is something that I, I looked at after. I'm like, wow, my tongue is so you know, clean and pink. And I was kind of showing it off to some friends and, and they're like, but I thought you had to do this really aggressive candida cleanse. I'm like, no, you just need to get rid of parasites and, and do these other things that are clearing up the gut. And, and so certainly that's my recommendation on the subject. Excellent. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing all that. So a short recap, obviously avoid the GMO foods right? And do a parasite cleanse. You've talked about wheat quite a bit. And I know we've talked about it in terms of being a GMO crop, but let's talk a little bit about wheat and gluten and specifically how gluten affects the body and really affects the mind. Okay. Fantastic. So on the wheat and gluten question, thankfully we have covered some key parts of this, but a good takeaway is to firstly just have a better understanding because if somebody like because the, the issue with um sometimes it's because we don't have the information quite straight that we get in a pickle for example if i was to say 
the issue is with gluten. That's the reason why, like, that's it's a and it's an underlying factor behind a lot of autoimmune disease in America. Then people will come back to you and say, "Well, look, look at the societies that have had this in their food supply. Wheat has been a part of it for a long time, so gluten has been naturally occurring in wheat. So, and and it and it hasn't been to this level. So then you start to realize that." the alterations here um, separate it. And so you can start to understand that wheat and gluten are in two different categories that they do overlap. So wheat has gluten, but you have a look at another example of another grain, which is spelt, S-P-E-L-T, which is an ancient grain. It's having a bit of a, a comeback. Iron corn is as well, iron corn. But you'll find that, you know, take the spelt, for example, this was discovered in 700 BC and it was, it has not been touched or altered in its genetic structure since then, whereas you find out that the wheat has gone through a process called chemical mutagenesis. So you, even the word mutagenesis is a mutation of the gene. However, and, and then we then we get lambasted and told that we're being fanatical when we're telling people that it, it's associated with genetically modified organisms, even though it doesn't class under the category. But certainly, I mean, chemical mutagenesis, do you want any more clear description on what, what it means to mutate a gene and to chemically radiate something and, and, and think that it's going to do to, to, do anyone any good at all. So certainly there is no such thing as organic weed in America. I just wish it wasn't true because there's no way to differentiate because it doesn't fall under the GMO laws. So therefore it can be listed as organic. Um, and, but there are parts of the world that people don't have the issue. And that's why you can see a lot of anecdotal case studies of people in certain parts of Europe that are saying they're not having issues and they're celiac and they can eat wheat out there. So clearly that starts to, you start to understand that the gluten itself is not necessarily the issue from a, fact scientific point of view even though that may be anecdotally what somebody experiences and so it may be good to get off all forms of of wheat and gluten but i personally found for me that getting off of of wheat not necessarily gluten um so being able to use some of the ancient grains has been something that has worked for me however i think that everyone should test test that on a case-by-case -case basis and look for the science that's backing up what they're doing so they're not like in a fad because that's what makes people fall off the the bandwagon and that type of thing so certainly um it's simple um and i just want to give people the understanding that that there's nothing crazy about it yes you do have to say no to some certain things but you're also saying no to that sore tummy that you're feeling and you're also saying no to the foggy headedness that you feel um, certainly these are things that you don't need and it, even if you think that you don't have a sensitivity to it look for the facts on this you we we really need to be considering that if it's not good for me why am i putting it in my body it's i'm wasting the time that it takes to emasticate this food i am wasting my money and um, I'm, I'm wasting my health because even though i might not have immediate effects I am uh, continually making choices that are, uh, are not in favor of my body. So I, I really, if anyone wants to have really good, clear mental health, protect their brain, certainly understanding the, the wheat issue is important. There's a plenty of people that are, that are entertaining this subject. So I think that once you put that in tandem with, with um, implementing a great anti-parasite regime um, and, and some other things that we'll mention, I, I believe that we, we may get into the subject of heavy metal toxicity, of which I know that you guys are, are really big believers on of uncovering this issue with organics and and helping people like so they can they can have good cleanses on that then you you're really creating good toolbox there for yourself and you're preventing the the, the the challenges that most people are going to experience at some point but you have that assurance because you're doing the right thing i mean i, I like i think the tough thing for a lot of people to to grasp in society is they want a one-size-fits-all tell me exactly what to do and what's going to work for me but there's 7 billion of us on the planet and different things work for different people, right? What we do know is, is that certain things work for a majority of people. Eliminating that wheat will likely make you feel better, but try it for yourself, right? Give yourself 30 days to try eliminating that wheat and see how you feel and then let that be the de determining factor. Not what I read here, or what fat is going there, or this kind of diet or that kind of diet. Just, I think that's what we don't do enough of is we don't experiment with our body. Let's find out what works and what doesn't work. Let's find out what cleanses work. Let's find out what foods have us feel better, what, what has us think clear, all of that stuff. And so uh, I'm with you on that. Now, and one thing that I feel, I, I mean, sugar is very inflammatory. I, I think wheats and, and, and other flours like that can be inflammatory too. Is there a connection between inflammatory foods and inflammation and brain health? 
Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, I mean, John, you, you've done a lot of education with people around inflammation and inflammaging, which is a really um, cool term there that you've been circulating. This is certainly something to consider because inflammation is really the, the Greek, so, you know, the, the breakup of the word is to set on fire, right? So it's, it's a fire that's going on. And the question is, are you putting fuel on the fire for most people, the answer is yes. Yes, I'm putting fuel on the fire. I, I, I burn this fire with the choices that I make. When I put sugar in my body, I'm putting fuel on this fire. I'm letting it burn. Even though I could have made another choice and I could have put it stevia instead, I, you know, I chose sugar. And so I'm putting fuel on this fire. There's so many different things that people can, can do. So with inflammation, what we're finding is that if the gut is inflamed, the, the, the body is systemic. And so when that and what's amazing is in our series you'll find that our doctors really uncovered the conspiracy and these are really like non-conspiracy kind of doctors as well where i didn't expect it to come out of their mouth and and so some of my psych, psychologists psychiatrists and mds are, are explaining that this issue that came out um, decades ago which was explaining the chemical imbalance of the brain was actually a ploy to sell pharmaceuticals because it was really an inverted way to say that you have a Prozac deficiency. There's a Prozac shaped hole in your brain that you need this product and you'll be complete. When the real issue was to do with gut flora and other imbalances that were happening that, uh, and, and it was, and it was really just a con and it, and, and, and you can look that up. You can make your own analysis and understanding on that. But the problem is that we have looked at the, the wrong area. And so, I've got a problem in my head. I've got to fix my head. No, you don't. You need to be very mindful of the choices you're making. And now you need to work to undo the damage that we've all done either, you know, most, most of the time it's not our fault. We can be exposed to something. It's not our fault. We can be exposed, you know, if you were caught in Fukushima and you got heavy metal toxicity through your body, it wasn't your fault but you're responsible now to do what you can to get that out of your body. And there are tools. The body is actually designed to eliminate it and it does need help and needs you to partner with it and make choices and take things like the fulvix and the humic acid to, to grab onto those toxic metals and to bind them and pull them into the bloodstream, pull them back into the colon and excrete them from the body. So you can get rid of these pieces of junk that are spread through the body and they, they will go into the bones. They will go into these places. So, Certainly, these food choices that people are making, yes, the sugar, the inflammation that's happening uh, is all very relevant. And yes, the gut on fire, inflammation of the gut on fire does lead to the brain on fire. And it's a choice that we can make and we can be mindful and we can be responsible. And then we can make those transformations just with every choice that we make and, and taking the time to say, yes, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do a heavy metal toxicity cleanse using humic and fulvic acid. Yes, I'm going to do the parasite cleanse. Yes, I'm going to do, um, you know, uh, get off the inflammatory foods, and and you 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 really secured yourself. I couldn't agree more. I will give a caveat to our listeners to not necessarily do all of them all at one time. Take some, you know, do do it slowly. If you're used to doing cleanses, you probably can combine some of your cleanses and be okay. But if you're not used to doing cleanses, take a little bit slower. Um, anticipate maybe having the first couple of days of relaxed time so that you're not uh, on edge and, and just your body. It's getting rid of junk that's been in there. And, you know, you, you're just not always sure how it's going to react. So I think those are, are awesome points. Um, I know that we got to wrap up the interview here in just a couple minutes. Are there any other key points that you can give us? Uh, I, I know a lot of our audience is very interested in preventing dementia, Alzheimer's, other brain health, like depression, anxiety, things like that. Are there any other key points that you can make, other pointers that, that, that we can just walk away with and, and have? Absolutely. So, yeah, bringing up these couple of major neurodegenerative challenges that we're looking at that we're all um, concerned about, even people, you know, my age, so I'm, I'm coming up to mid-30s now, about to await my first child. That's an issue. You know, protecting my mental health and the state of my brain is very important to me, my wife, and and for my my, my father-in-law, my father, mother, you know, my grandparents. These are all very important to me. 
And so certainly they're things that I, I'm thinking about a lot. I'm sharing the information, we're applying it. For example, I mean, my, my father-in-law's kidney function went all the way down to 8%. And uh, truth be told, I was up till like 2 a.m. this morning. He just, he just flew out, he was out visiting just because um, he was wanting to be here while my wife was here to see if they would be here when the baby came, but he had to get back for work and the, the baby's still waiting until he comes. But I was up till like 2 a.m. talking with him last night, trying to, um, work through some of the challenges that 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 he was you know facing with with his health to to kind of work through it so I certainly understand um, what it's like and from from that perspective so having his kidney function go so low and we had to amazingly enough bring it up and we did work with Dr. Newsom uh, of all people right so which you guys are very familiar with his work and he's, he's a fantastic doctor we're able to see his kidney function bounce up to uh, just short of 30% in six weeks, which is, is a medical miracle, but it's the, it's the mystery and the wonder and the beauty of the body. And so to answer the question coming into these neurodegenerative challenges that we all uh, are looking at, there's a couple of things that I would like to bring up that aren't being talked about a lot. Um, one is a, an interview I just did with uh, a couple of doctors just recently, and we will be sharing uh, this information in our series, um, Dr. Dean Scherzai, he he's actually like based over in Loma Linda because they're looking at what was happening with the blue zones. Very, very important to, to not overlook that information because we've got to distinct, distinguish between what's fad and what's actually going to work. Because if I don't start teaching this and making this clear, I'm going to have a lot of guilt and regret in 20, 30 years when the things that I taught didn't actually work. And I was looking at some, some like hacks and some things that work short, short term, but they weren't working long term. The things that we know work long term are things like the blue zone studies that National Ge Geographic did under researcher Dan Bootner, who discovered that these five longest living groups of people in the world, one of them being in America, um, have the, have this ability to get up to a, age 100 and beyond without aches and pains. Um, one, of, one of the doctors that we had in a series was Dr. Elmsworth Wareham, who was, he just actually passed at 104, which is, which is old, but what's most important about his story is that he was a surgeon up to age 95. And you, you won't believe that. You can look at the Fox News story on him. It, it, he was, he was a, a surgeon's assistant from age 75 to 95. And which, which means that he was actually performing operations. And I know other surgeons that worked under him during that time. And people, I don't want a 95 year old to work on me with shaking hands. Like he didn't have aches and pains. He didn't have memory loss. His hands weren't shaking. So what were his secrets? And what, why, why, did we, why are these doctors like Dr. Dean Scherzer moving over to Loma Linda? They're not uh, of that um, group of people that are out there that are getting these results, but they're so fascinated with the results. They are doing, they, they are basing um, uh, eight, eight health principles. They base it off an acronym, new start. So new one word start. So which is nutrition, exercise, water, new start, sunshine, um, temperance, A, air, um, R, rest, and T, trust in God. So that's new. That's the new start acronym that they go by that is so effective for them. And one of the key points I want to bring out without going into every detail that you can look that up and see how you can imply some of these lifestyle principles that a lot of people are neglecting because certainly exercise is so key. It doesn't get emphasized enough. And I, I, I went out to the, the, the world leading new start clinics to talk with all the doctors. I mean, what's your biggest secrets? And, and I was surprised. I was looking for like a magical ingredient, but what were they telling me? Exercise. They were saying that there's no greater thing that will, will lit, like equate to your longevity than exercise. And that's a huge rebuke for those of us that just want to kind of pop, pop the pill, even if it's a natural good supplement and, and eat a good healthy meal and think that we've done it. No, we need to be out walking or, you know, doing that high interval training, getting the heart rate up by, by doing a little run and then walking slower or, you know, pushing a couple of weights and that type of thing. But the other thing I do want to mention with all the blue zone studies was that they did have a, a much lower animal intake than the rest of the American public. And a lot of people were resorting to having a look, Oh, well look at the Maasai people. They have lower rates, rates of cancer and they eat lots of um, animal product. But the reality of they, they were, you can look at the numbers. They're literally eating 10 times less meat than the average American and their longevity isn't amazing as well, but their, their, their cancer fighting is a lot higher because of, I believe because of their exercise. 
but they are eating a lot of roots and vegetables and types, types of things like that. So my big encouragement to people is to consider these studies. Dr. Dean shows, I cited to me a study in a recent interview that I just did with him. And I just loved it because he was sharing a 3000 person case study that was done in, done in Loma Linda. And of the 3000 people, do you know how, how many of those people had um, or on the, on the spectrum for dementia or had dementia? 19. 19 out of 3,000. You want to know how high it is for the rest of the public? It's one in three. One in three seniors will die of dementia or Alzheimer's. And if you get past the age of 85, it's one in two. And, and so you can like measure up those statistics against each other, try and understand what's going on here, but that's less than a single percent. And, uh, and this is largely going from a group of people that are largely vegetarian. So if you look at the other four blue zones, none of them are vegetarian per se, but they have a lot less meat intake. They're talking more like a couple of times a week or a couple of times a month, and that's max. And so just just don't dichotomize it and put it in a way that makes you feel like you can't win that game or you feel restricted. Just think about doing a lot less of the animal intake and, and knowing what it's like to fill a plate, fill with uh, gorgeous fruits and vegetables and, and, and nuts and avocados and all these different f foods that are delicious and healthy and, and the gluten-free types of alternatives or, or simply just you know, making sure you're majoring a lot in these healthy vegetables with all the flavors that you can put in to your diet through the delicious spices that are available to us and just live a healthy and happy life. That's my biggest advice. And make sure you do join us for our series because we will uh, certainly be sharing a lot more with you there where we can dive deeper into this rabbit hole and give you all the keys that you need to live a happy and healthy life. That's my commitment to you. And that's John's commitment to you. John, thanks for joining us. Listen, if you're watching and you want to learn more about John and his documentaries, just click the link below. It's absolutely free to watch. I highly encourage you to check it out. And uh, John, I appreciate what you're doing in the world. I appreciate anybody that's out there trying to make a difference and you're doing it in a big way. You're reaching hundreds of thousands of people and uh, I'm honored to know you. I'm honored to interview you and I just wish you the best of luck. And uh, thanks for spending uh, an hour with us here. Thanks, John. I appreciate it, mate. Really appreciate it. Excellent. Thank you.